exercise coming. So I've heard some grumblings. Yes, we were supposed to be an IEBC code review today with Dick Sampson. Anybody that's aggrieved by that, come see me. You are now on the Energy Committee. So Friday afternoon, we were able to get a hold of Cisco to have him come present to us. Otherwise, we'd all be playing cards today. So I apologize anybody aggrieved that we're not having the IEBC. Uh, talking with uh, our presenter, he came back, he was under the assumption, I did not set the speaker up for us, that it was a luncheon. And we were gonna pop in, talk to you guys for half an hour and leave. So I had a scramble and luckily we were able to scramble and get somebody in. So I apologize for that. It was either that or I canceled the meeting. So today we have Cisco Men Mendez Meneses. Uh, I believe he's been before us before for our Mikey U. Um, so he's going to be here today. We have another packet that I have not handed out yet. Each community, he brought us, I think we have what, 18 of them. Each community that's in here, if we don't have one, we will get you one. But one per community, I will leave them up in front. Just respect your other communities so that everybody can at least get one of the books. Um, he was nice enough to bring them into us. They will be up on the front. Any questions? So two sign-in sheets, one for next month. It will be all day. Um, I don't know how we're going to work, what they're going to have, danishes or drinks or whatever else. We'll get something for that. But it's basically for that book count. And then for the CBO going around now, I hopefully will have all the certificates from this date forward. Um, ICC haven't given us heads up on this. So when your certificate does come back to you, it's going to be one of the day they approve it. But I'm sending the sign out. She signed it today, so at least you can get credit for it. Any questions? It's all yours. Just so you know, the ICC has approved my course. Uh, we did uh, for the state of Pennsylvania. So just a matter of uh, time. It might a matter of time, but uh, he's, I use kind of short time when you call me to do this. So let's talk and about. We thank you for that because, like I said, we'd all be playing cards today. Anything for a cup of coffee and a donut. Just, uh, just my um, so, <clears throat> let me give you a little bit of history. Let's see what we're talking about here. Um, and um, as you may or may not know, I've been doing this almost for 10 years now. But not just in Massachusetts. Um, we've done classes like this from Seattle to San Diego, from Chicago to Texas, and from Maine to Florida. So not always is it always received well, but it is what I call the bastard child of egress. Okay, and the main thing about this is that a lot of people have a fire escape in their community and a lot of times it's out of sight, out of mind. Don't write a violation on it so that you don't have to deal with it and that's what we have. So what you have in front of you is uh, one of two cities now that have taken on the program and that Lowell has been working with us on this exact program that I'm about to share with you for probably about five years. We've already done half a dozen. If you go online, go to YouTube and just type in Firescape Seminar, you'll see all the classes nationwide. Okay, um, <clears throat> Everett just did this, uh, what you have in front of you is what Everett just came up with. We did the same exact class for Everett. Somebody in Lowell moved to Everett and they brought me in there. Now Everett is, a, is doing this exact program. And the key to the whole program is really about getting fire escapes under control because it's been out of control for many, many years. And the key is getting a questionnaire. So in the, if you've ever seen a confidence test out there, I'm the one that created it many years ago for the first state was actually in Seattle. And it had to be an accident. Four guys fell almost to their death. And we created a checklist item of what they should be asking for if you're an architect, you're an engineer, or even a fire escape inspector. Okay? So that's all this is. From that, it basically sets a tone of what the fire escape should be, what things should be looked at on a fire escape. Because believe it or not, all you're getting in the state of Massachusetts is a document that a lot of people just copy right from Boston and it says right on the document to the best of my information knowledge and belief the fire escape is in conformity with the mass building code it's, like, it's basically a golden parachute but there's no questions like well what was good everything was good some of the things were good so I'm going to go over at the end of this class this class is usually a six hour class and we do a morning view of talking about the history of fire escapes and then we do an afternoon and we actually watch videos online of, of real inspections that have happened. Or if I'm in a city where there's a downtown, a lot of you guys would go with me downtown, and we do what's called a downtown walk around, learning the new, the new information you just got. So let me go very quickly, because this is a two hour class, this is called a technical class. I just get heavy into what's wrong with fire escapes, what is rusty bolts, and a lot of times, 
when I have time, I have two pieces of rusty fire escape that I bring up here, like I did the last class. And if, during cer certain breaks, you can actually come here and just look at the rusty fire escapes because it'll, it'll sort of complement what we see here and what you're going to see here with a real uh, couple pieces of fire escape. So let me tell you what we have here. <clears throat> now I'm going to talk about what this means to you guys. So um, what I have in your hands, this is called a confidence test. And when, you, when we go over at the end of this, in two hours from now, we're going to go over line by line. There's 25 questions that every engineer, every architect, and every inspector of a fire escape system must answer yes, no, no opinions. Either does it, it's not applicable, or give me a yes, no on it. And by taking every piece of the component of the fire escape apart, you're going to get a real uh, report on the fire escape. And you, don't, you get this whether the fire escape passes or fails. Everybody here is just getting the, the uh, certificate at the end. Very rare you get a report that says it failed, Mr. Inspector, take a look at it. You always get the, there's always this mystery. Number two is a lot of these fire escapes are getting uh, certified or repaired without a, without a uh, permit. Because a lot of the guys who show up with their welding machines, and you know welding machines killed two firemen two years ago, right? Basically they show up and they repair the fire escape under its general maintenance and it's, I'm just painting it and I'm changing a couple of bolts. In their actuality, they're, they're blasting the whole thing into uh, a full repair. And then the final is, a lot of times a certificate is just sent to you and you just receive it in the mail and it goes in their jacket. You don't have a final process to go there and either meet with the, building, the vendor to sign off the permit or meet with the engineer who says, let's take a look at this. So Everett, if anybody wants the contact, that Everett is probably going to be Martin Furtado. He brought us in, so you want to call him and say, hey, how's it going? You think, this, there, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, I did a class just like this, and it's actually online. When you get a chance, go to, go to Firescape Seminar Everett. And this class, which is being recorded now, is the same class that you can have other people that didn't make today's meeting, they can watch this online. Just go to YouTube, type in Firescape Seminar. The best part of this uh, uh, document is the page six. Page six belongs to the vendor. And if a vendor is going to be doing any repair work, he needs to submit this document which tells you that he has a license, not a business license, he has a construction license of some sort, he has workers' comp and liability, he has all the things necessary in order to go pull a permit because the fire escape needs to be watched by a design professional or others acceptable to you. So this is the mousetrap. This whole thing is to basically, we call this the mousetrap. It's either it's made to catch rats, not cats. So if a fire, if an engineer, an architect, and an inspector is a good guy, this will not catch them. They'll gladly fill all these documents out. If a vendor is a good guy, he'll gladly fill this out because he has all the information. If he doesn't have all the information, then he can't pull a permit and he shouldn't be doing that job. And that's sadly what happened in the past 25 to 50 years. What also you have, if you look at the second documents, <coughs> these are tags. These tags, in some states, they, it's mandatory that you put a tag on your fire escape. Like it's mandatory to have a tag on your elevator. <laughs> All fire protection systems, and that's where we really fall under. We are a fire protection system. We're the only fire protection system that has no tag on it. You walk in a building, uh, smoke, uh, smoke detectors must be tagged, uh, extinguishers must be tagged, fire pumps must be tagged, sprinklers must be tagged, that they were inspected when? In whatever the time period was. And here we have a fire escape that has no tagging requirements. But you go to Portland, Oregon, they have a tagging requirement. This is it. You go to Seattle, they have a tag requirement. So that in the middle of the night when a, when a, a, a firefighter is running down the, the, the alleyway, and guess what, do we have any firefighters are in this room? No, let me tell you what the, word, the, what the old guys teach the new guys coming into fire fires. Ready? Maybe you already know the answer. In case of fire, don't use the... Does everybody know that? All firemen in the entire U.S. have taught that when they get to a fire escape, don't use it because it will probably kill you. Do you guys send out that notice to the building owners and the building tenants? By the way, in case of fire, do not ever use this fire. Don't just rip them off all the buildings since we're not, no, somebody coming to rescue is not going to use it. And if you tell your tenants not to use it, you know, then we really don't need to repair these. Let's just get rid of them all. Oh, but there's that crazy law you guys have, two means of egress. So guess what? In the United States, every fireman is taught. But imagine they run down the street, and these are shrunken versions because the tag is usually eight and a half by 11. They come in three colors. They come in white for certified, and you'll never sign one. It has to be signed and certified by a structural engineer, a registered architect, or others acceptable to you. 
the yellows are the fire escape is in repair, and a red means the building has got a problem, that fire escape is non usable, and they have either scaffolding or some other alternative means of, for that building while that building's been shut down. On the book that I would show you, that uh, normally is part of our class, the tags are color. And that's what the tags look like. So when you go down the building, a, permanently affixed to the building on the fire escape, seven to 10 feet off the ground, you'd see a white tag, a yellow tag, or a red tag. So the firemen now are, are trained, when you get to the, to the building and there's a red tag on it, they don't use the fire escape. And there's a yellow tag, they, you know, they can use the fire escape and proceed with caution. But to their knowledge, there's no life safety concern of any kind. And if there's a white tag, signed by a structural engineer or others acceptable to the building official, they, it's all right, get on it, save the people, because most people die within the first three to five minutes due to what, fire or smoke? Smoke. Okay, so when you call Seattle, every tag in Seattle, they've made it an ordinance, every building must have a fire escape tag. In Portland, Oregon, every building must have a fire escape tag. Lowell and Everett is now implementing this program. They just want somebody to be aware. And not, at the same time, on that tag, which you'll be able to read, it also tells you when the next fire escape inspection, is, the due date is. So it's not just for firemen. When you're walking the alleyways and you're walking below a fire escape, you can see whether or not the fire escape has been certified. So we're going to talk about that. The last piece we're going to talk about, because we're going to be technical today, how for 100 years fire escapes have not changed. So when you, these are just little technical drawings that say every fire escape has been built one way for 100 years. Now there's been modifications to that. People have used wood, fiberglass, cement, any, any other crazy things that people have put plastic on their fire escape. Again, none of those are necessarily approvable because it depends on whether it was done by a professional or not. But some fire escapes out there are been, have been butchered and put together by you know the midnight stalkers. Okay, so this is going to get technical, and what I want to do is. <clears throat> I have, we have an interpretation of the codes, and I'm going to show all four codes, IFC, IBC, NFPA, OSHA. We're going to talk about all of them and how they all say the same thing. But remember, don't nail me with code. I'll just direct you. Because in some cases, we've had code issues where this side disagrees with this side. So ask questions, but it's really going to be a fast track technical. So let's talk about load testing. Anybody in this room has ever witnessed a load test in this city? Great. So I've done load testing throughout the United States, you know, the 100 pounds per square foot. And I've done one load test, and I did it in Cambridge, but not because of the request of the city or, or the, uh, the, uh, the client. I did it just so I can have a recording to show you guys. Okay, so I have a load test. So never, nobody's ever seen sandbags being dragged around. It's not only on, on today's class. There's actually a website, if you want to write this down, called firescapesma.com. So if anybody wants to learn what needs to be done on a fire escape, and I'll show you this later on, it's a general website that we've put out that basically all your questions can be answered, and a lot of it keeps directing it back to the building official to verify that everything that's on there is correct. Okay? So let's talk about these fire escapes. Why is this fire escape? Anybody tell by the hats how old this picture is? Right in the 50s, 40s, right? So let's talk about what a fire escape, 100 pounds per square foot. Let me tell you how well built these things are. If you've got a five by five, see where all those guys are up at the very top? Five by five. Five by five times a hundred, uh, time, five times five is 25 square feet, correct? Times 100 is 2,500 pounds. So you ask me to load test this fire escape, I gotta bring 2,500 pounds of sandbags. That is 50 pound sandbags carried by seven men on average. We have to drag all the bags up there and we have to put 40% of the load on there first, and then the remaining 60% on there. But let's talk about what's, what actual is the space that you can do. So if I have tenants in this building, and I have 150 pound tenants, if I bring 10 of them out that, during that fire, and they get on that five by five, first of all, can I get 10 in there? Let's say they're all doing piggyback right now. So 10, five, 10 tenants at 150 pounds, right, is 1,500 pounds. How many more pounds is left for us to really bring this to its threshold? A thousand more pounds to go. So these were built way beyond. Okay? Understand? So th this fire escape, there's a, not only do we load test it beyond compact, we load test it beyond people. So to do an actual 100 pound test, we'd need 500 pound people who basically are not 
built sideways, they're all built tall. So you put 500 pound people and you give them the average square footage that they need. So that would, that would be the equivalent of a 100 pound uh, load test. So how safe is a fire escape test? Was properly installed and properly maintained. Will it ever fail? Forget about the wall, if the wall fails, that's a whole different story. Will a properly fabricated, properly installed, properly maintained fire escape ever fail? So with that, that's telling you, so if somebody says, oh, you can't party out of these fire escapes, you can't do this and you can't do that, it's not that we're saying let people smoke and let people party on these things, we're telling you that she's overbuilt. Same thing for a fireman. How many firemen can get out on there that the average fireman is 200 pounds plus 100 pounds of gear? So if we put five firemen out there that are 300 pounds a piece, how many more pounds do we have above and beyond that? Another thousand pounds. So these things, way back 100 years ago when they came up with these codes and they haven't changed them since, they went way beyond. Okay? So that's how safe fire escapes are that are properly maintained, properly installed, properly fabricated. Now is there a variant on that? Yeah. Not properly made, not properly installed, not maintain, how safe is this? This is why firemen don't go to fire escapes. And they need a tag of some sort so that when they arrive, it's gonna take three to five years, this is not gonna happen overnight, they're gonna have, have to regain the confidence. In all the states, 40 out of 50 states, fire prevention runs the show when it comes to fire escape inspections. In 10 out of 50 states, building department runs the show. This is one of those states. So that's why they don't play very good volleyball with you guys when you guys invite them to, uh, to these games is because you guys, they claim, they didn't drop the ball on this, they claim you guys dropped the ball on maintaining fire escapes. Just, she sat so long. All right, so now you see what the tags are going to look like. So very vivid. And uh, we, uh, Everett asked us to actually modify some of the backs so that they're pretty clear in what they say. If you look at the backs, there's a front and there's a back on the uh, fire escape uh, tags. The basic information is on the front, guys. You know, who did the work, uh, who signed off on the work, okay? And then on the back, uh, if when the fire escape is examined. So what this is, is Everett has the yellows and the reds. So when they go out and do it, normal inspections. And anybody that's an architect, an engineer, or a fire escape inspector, they go out, they have the uh, yellows and the reds. So when you leave a fire escape inspection, you've got to leave it with a yellow tack. Again, just laminated, you know, simple laminated, put a zip tie to it. Because the final white one, and I'll show you pictures of ones up in the air, the final white ones have to be done, not laminated. They have to be done on a special, like, one-eighth plastic, because uh, it's going to last for five years. Okay? So, first. Why would you just have the year? Well, well, then don't forget, this is going to be up high, and you can actually see the year from 7 to 10 feet. This is not 15 feet in the air. This is 7 to 10, and it tells you when it was inspected, when's the next date of inspection. You know what I'm saying? So the, this, this, uh, the important thing on the front of the tag is going to be really who was the inspector, who was the vendor, a lot of the information. It's all in that front, on that front tag. Okay? All right, so we've created a document that, as you guys know, sometimes there's a code and there's an interpretation of the code. So on this document, and we can send it to you in the PDF, you can remove all National Fire Safety Association, because this is PDF or Word, but basically this is what we'd like you to do uh, if you're going to be inspecting a fire escape as a structural engineer, as a registered architect, or an inspector. Here's what you're going to have to do if you're going to be repairing the fire escape with the guidance of the engineer. And this is what you're going to do if you're going to deal with a fire escape and you're going to paint it which we also have the EPA renovator law that says what? Every fire escape older than 78 has what? Lead. Guess what you can't do to lead? Can't burn it. So that means what happened to welding? Gone. It's a good thing it got gone. You know why? Most fire escapes in the U.S., 99% of all the fire escapes ever built in the U.S. are bolted fire escapes. Because when they heat up in the summer, and there's a bolt holding some connection, and they heat up in the summer, they do this, and the bolt lets it flex. But it does what to the paint? It cracks the paint, which allows water or air to get in there. But as it does this during the summer, it also does this during the winter. 
It also does this when there's a minor earthquake. And it also does this when there's some wind or anything shifting. As soon as you weld the fire escape, any welders in the place? The welders? Well, the, the terminology is weld, snap, bolt, stretch. If I introduce rush jacking where these two want to separate, these two connections want to separate, a bolt will scream for 10 to 15 years. So when you have a bolt and it starts rush jacking inside, they'll start doing this and stop bulging. And as she's trying to tear that shaft, which is the middle of the bolt, she'll scream for 10 to 15 years and eventually that bolt will get eaten by rust and eventually snap. But as soon as you introduce welding, what happens to welds? Are welds forgiving? As soon as it starts heating up in the summer and doing this and cooling down in the winter and doing this, way before rust jacking is introduced, what happens to those, to those welds? They rip. How do I know they're going to rip? Well, you do an x-ray, you do a radiography, and you will see microscopic cracks already on that, on that weld. So I'm telling you, I inspect nationwide. 99% of all the fire escapes ever built in the U.S. today and in the past were all bolted and riveted fire escapes for that very reason. Okay? So let's keep on. Uh, questions so far? You agree with me, disagree with me? All right, write this down. If this is in uh, Portland, you go to, you, you go to the YouTube, uh, I mean, not, you go on the internet, type in fire-208 fire escape issues. Or die, just type in fire escape issues, and you're going to see Portland, Oregon. They actually took this program and put it into the state code. The process of inspecting that we're talking about. Now, we, we've been working with them for 10 years. My last class was just two months ago. And it's the same exact program. So they started with a questionnaire. They started, so they're really the model. But they didn't take it just for the, for the city of Portland. They actually adopted it into the state code. OK? So if you want, this is one place to go, Firescape code. Another one you want to put on your, on your sheet for looking up, Reg 4, Regulation 4 in LA. Now, Regulation 4 basically is, again, run by the fire department. They control all fire protection. And they have all these questionnaires, and they have all these checklists including a fire escape checklist that they, they have the questions for me. And basically, if you want to copy a, a great fire protection program, everybody who is in that program, like myself, gets a license for three years, pays $1,000 to join that beautiful program, and I have to pass with an 80, so there's a real rigorous program of, of everybody, from sprinklers to fire escapes. So if you want to, to and you're looking for things out there, you got Seattle.gov uh, uh, Seattle to go to, Portland, LA, okay? And now obviously you have two model cities right now. You have Everett to call, and you've got uh, in Lowell, and if anybody knows uh, Paul Winchester or uh, Sean Shanahan up there, give them a call and see. They've been at this program for over five years, okay? But th they even talk about everything. They talk about welding, they talk about repairs, they talk about the paint. So if you want to go steal this information, you can't. Or if you want us just to send one of our confidence tests to you and for you to review and have your legal department review, feel free. Or again, call the, the, two, the two cities, Everett and or Lowell. So this is a confidence test. It's 25 questions. What this is, is basically a fire escape can be described into 25 components with number 25 being a catch-all. So in case there's a, somebody's got a, a llama uh, you know, tied underneath the fire escape, that's what question number 25 picks up. Anything uh, such as uh, you know uh, covers or, or uh, any act, anybody parking underneath the fire escape, a chicken coop underneath the fire escape, number 25. Otherwise, treads, bolts, supports, cement, connection into the building, everything's covered on these questions. And everybody that's a structural engineer, registered architect, or a fire escape inspector must answer every one of these questions so that it's no longer an opinion. They're going to tell you yes, there is, or yes, or no, there isn't any rust internally in any of these connections we're talking about. We're not talking about surface rust, because that's a maintenance thing. Surface rust is a maintenance. It needs painting. Internal rust is a structural issue. And that's what we'll cover this at the end when we review this. Okay? We have all the codes on all the pages. So again, we're going to get back to this. And it makes us call the city official, because one of the things that we have to ask, and again, this is going back to LA, I can't inspect the fire escape unless I call the city first and let them give them two days' notice to see if they want to witness the exam. Has anybody ever called you to come and witness a fire escape exam? So in LA, it's part of your license requirement. By the way, if I find a light, if I get there and there's a life safety issue, such as a dangling tread, a truck hit it, I mean a life safety issue, not general maintenance. 
My license in LA tells me to stay there, call the fire department, the closest fire department, and until that fire truck shows up and takes over for me, I can't leave. Got it? Or I could risk losing my license, which I have to re refinance every three years because they say, oh, do you want to update your 50% fee? Some of you may remember this, the station night fire, you guys remember? That's where this all started. I got called by Hank Philippi Ryan in 2003. I'm sorry. Yeah, it was 2003. Um, we were right around the station night fire. And this is how long I've been doing it since, since this thing. She asked me, listen, uh, 100 people or so died down there in the station night fire. I want to have a little show, a little piece that I want to do for a minute or two, talking about fire escapes and that in case of a fire, you can get yourself out and save you. So I told her, listen, I've been inspecting fire escapes since my dad hijacked me in 71. Uh, in 71. My dad's still working uh, on fire escapes till the present day. And uh, she says, I, still, I told her 50 to 75% of everything I inspect fails. She goes, no way, there's laws, there's rules. I said, well, I brought her down to downtown, the theater district, and gave her a 15 minute course on inspecting, looking for real you know, bad things, such as broken treads, missing cement. So that's all she got for training. And her two-minute piece became a five-minute a five minute piece, which some of you may recognize. The smoke, the flames, and the frightened faces, all in a firefighter's line of duty. But Chief William Hitchcock remembers the night it wasn't the fire that almost stopped him. Of course, scared to death. <laughs> but the fire escaped that broke underneath him.
they don't always know if owners are breaking the law. The building code is being ignored. Right, but it's difficult to write a violation you don't have knowledge of something like that. But state officials say for a critical issue like this, communities should know. And they warn the Massachusetts building code is not optional. Does it worry you that these fire escapes are not being certified? This is an important issue and should not be ignored. That's because after the smoke and flames begin, it'll be too late to learn you've got no way out. I can't stress it enough, Hank, that these things have to be maintained and someone's got to be watching. As a result of our investigation, state officials will now issue an alert to local inspectors. Meanwhile, if there's a fire escape on your home or office, you can contact your local building department to make sure it's properly certified. In the newsroom, I'm Hank Philippi Ryan. Anybody remember that memo? No. So, on the back of this book, what we have is, you guys remember this from 1973. You know why you have a five-year rule? Because in 1973, this, this killed the woman, the niece landed on her, this is in Marlboro Street, and the fireman saved his life by hanging off <coughs> with one hand. I think they just celebrated like 40 years of, of that event, okay? So until there's a tragedy, and two years ago, what did we have that really emphasized the welding that's going on? Right? And, and, and here's the funny thing, because I put my word out there, but can you, do you repair fire escapes with welding? So they're going to they're gonna be coming out with a little bit more stiffer laws about hot permits and stuff. What does that have to do with fire escapes if the repair for a fire escape is not welding? Oh, it's the cheap repair, because then the magical threes, whenever you have a five-story fire escape, let me give you some numbers. A magical fire escape of five stories, on average, will be repaired from spot to full reefer, fifteen to $25,000, not including engineer oversight fees. Let me tell you what the magic threes they're going to get, whether you're in Boston or whether you're in Worcester or whether you're somewhere. Let me tell you the magic threes, because there is no engineer oversight, there isn't a checklist, there isn't a repair report, there isn't a permit. The magic threes that they're going to get for that same job is $3,000, $13,000, and $33,000. Guess who wins? No permit, in need, no permit needed. Guess who wins? So the 3,000 guy shows up and he starts welding the fire escape. Does he remove the rust and weld or does he weld the rust into position? Right? I don't know if anybody, I mean, I'm going to be showing the footage of that fire, the two firemen that died. You see any tools on the, on the, you see any tools on the, on the fire escape there that they were repairing it? Or you see a welding machine cables that caught the neighbor's shed on fire that burned down a five-story building and killed two firemen in the process? Right? So the $3,000 guy shows up. First tool out of his bag, rust paint. Second tool out of his bag, caulking. Black, so silicone. So you paint the fire escape first, you caulk all the rust into hide and seek mode, and then what do you do? What's the third thing he brings out? The welding machine, to do what? Fix the obvious. You know what the obvious is? What the paint and the caulking wouldn't hold together. You want proof? Look at the last certificates you've got in your city and go back and have a structural engineer walk out with you bring a little poker of some kind, and you're gonna see rust at your fire escape. If there was no permit pulled on it and a certificate just showed up from, uh, we use the, the terminology, what do they call that stamp? For a guy that just signs anything, you, what's your terminology for, the, for those guys? What is it? The rubber. I'm gonna be more vulgar, I was gonna say, you know, there's the rubber, the rubber stamper and there's the stamp horse. How much do they charge? Very little? Because they got the golden parachute statement that you guys allow that the state of Massachusetts pulls out. And what's it say on that single sheet that Boston uses, that a lot of the cities use, and they just remove Boston from the top and they put, you know, their city on there? And what's it say right in the middle? To the best of my information, knowledge, and belief, the fire escape is in conformity with the mass building code. How golden is that parachute, in case anybody gets hurt or dies? So these five, these questions don't allow that. Okay? And even if somebody doesn't want to fill out this industry standard questionnaire, you know what you say? 
because it's not a mass document, you know what you say? Well, why don't you read the questions and answer them on your letterhead? <clears throat> Got it? Because that will come up. Okay? So let's talk about what happened right after this. Right after this, Boston says, hey, let's make sure the fire escapes are certified. At the end of a fire escape, before we sign off on the permit, not the fire escape, but a building re remodel, we'll make sure they have a certificate, otherwise we can't close the permit. That's what they did. So I'm telling you what we're going to be talking about today at the end of the class is that you're going to be creating a checklist. You will not create a special task force for fire escapes. You're not going to do anything different. But you are going to make a checklist item that's going to involve four departments. Your building department, when you're pulling a permit on any building, does it need to have you know, uh, plans by an architect, pay all your taxes, make sure your water's all paid. Do you guys have a checklist in order to issue a permit? Bring the check. Do you guys have all those things? Fill it out correctly, sign it, have a, con a construction supervisor's license. You're going to add to your checklist. So add this. This is all you have to do. Just add to your checklist during the permit process that in order for you to be working, as OSHA says, on any building during renovations and repairs, you need to maintain two means of egress because most fires happen during renovations. So you're asking for a copy of this certificate. You're not ordering one. And, that, and to make sure the juices are flowing, don't stop the process. Even if they say, I don't have one at this time, you say, well, I'll give you seven to ten days. Issue the permit. Because you stop the permit, then the mayor's going to call you and say what? Right? So start the process. We're going to get into that. The second thing, smoke detector signs off. Or re-rentals or sales. What's the, before you can even get into that, what's the fire department want last? This is a checklist item. Before they'll allow occupancy. Smoke detector sign off. Guess what your fire departments are going to ask for now? And they're not going to interrupt any occupancy. Guess what they ask for as a copy during the smoke detector sign off? Because the smokes are there, they signed off, they say, I need a copy of the fire escape affidavit. Not having one, they still sign off, they still, but then they refer back to you one more incomplete sign off on the smoke detectors. And what do you guys do? You issue. So we're not going to have any special task force. You're going to Permits and smoke detectors are going to bring, bring these people in. How about health department and housing? Before they'll allow Section 8 housing to go in, guess what they'll ask for? A verification that you have a safe structures initiative. Because that's what you're going to try to call this. You have to have some sort of statement that you want to put out there that says, this is a safe, safe structures initiative for the fire department, the building department, the housing, and the health department. So if somebody gets thrown out of their house for rats, roaches, or whatever, before they can re-enter, what's the health department going to ask for before they allow somebody to re-enter? A safe structure certificate, which is basically asking for a copy of this, that two means of egress have, have been verified. So that's what we're going to talk about today. We're not going to go looking for fire safety. They're going to come and find you on a daily basis. Got it? How many people remember this? Fire escapes have, uh, in 2014, believe it or not, we have more deaths nationwide on fire escapes than any other year I can remember. But this is how people die. Parades. What happens with parades? Uh, you, might, you guys remember the day when no, there was no a AC? Remember New York? These are, these are typical New York, New York photographs where people actually slept outside because there was no AC. Um, during medical emergencies, People that you're trying to get out and somehow they can't get out through the fire escape, they get hurt. Even worse, firemen get hurt because the fire escape tread gave way. And by the way, you see that picture on the top left corner, one of our uh, satellite groups, uh, his father fell seven stories to his death doing exactly that. Fixing the fire escape and he fell seven stories to his death. 57 years old. So it, it's not picky. Fire escapes will lead anybody will injure, maim, or kill anybody. Oh, by the way, when the insurance step, the company shows up and says, oh, what happened? Did somebody got hurt? What's the first thing they ask for? Certificate. Certificate. Having none, what do they say? We'll send some flowers. Whether it killed a tenant, whether it killed a fireman, whether it killed this guy, whether it killed kids, it doesn't matter. They just need that loophole, and the loophole is you must maintain your building at all time. And you don't have one, guess what happens? And then that tenant sues who? Because you didn't remind them. Isn't that what you're supposed to do? You're supposed to remind people who own property what they're supposed to be inspecting? Whose job is it to inspect their fire escape? Your job or their job? To maintain their fire escape with a five-year certificate. But you're going to get sued anyway. So, you know what I'm saying? So, 
To stop this, you need to have a tagging system that is right there in your face. You have it for elevators, you have it for extinguishers, you have it for so many things. So the only thing I'll tell you, nowhere in the country other than in Seattle and Portland, Oregon, is there an ordinance saying you must have a tag in your fire escape. Right now Lowell and Everett are looking at creating either an ordinance or voluntarily making sure that all fire escapes are tagged. How about these other things that are happening now in a lot of your buildings? Um, this is a new drama city, a series that they're going to be, uh, you know, a reality program where basically people cheat on each other through the back of the fire escape. That's, that's still in the works on that. But a lot of people doing weddings, shots on fire escapes. How horrible during a wedding when everybody collapses through. Somebody like that joke? See, I think only one guy got that joke about the reality program. Cheating, you know, fire escaping. That's the name of the show. It's called Fire Escape. And basically everybody's just cheating on each other. But there's going to be a fatality. There is drama. Somebody gets hurt in the fire escape. And what about students who can't smoke in the building? Where they smoke now? All right. Again, I'll be talking. And if you guys are, if I see anybody falling asleep, I'll start using a microphone. Otherwise, everybody hear me all right? Yep. All right. Um, this is another one. Bridgeport, Connecticut. But right now, firefighters are taking down the ladders and rolling up the hoses. But earlier in the night, when they pulled up, there were flames coming out of the side of the building. Firefighters say it was one of the scarier moments because when you pull up to a building and you see children and mothers Eight years on the side of the fire escape, smoke swirling around them. Is it that scary, scary stuff? They got up there, they got the ladders up, and they said nobody got hurt. The uh, fire escape, there was uh, three or four people hanging off the fire escape. They couldn't get off. They were just on the fire escapes. I had people hanging in the fire escapes at the rear of the building, and on this side of the building, they, we had a bunch of people on that fire escape. Oh, about 50 people were displaced inside this building. I'm not a fire fire There's good news tonight. It looks like everybody will be allowed to go back in, except the one unit where the fire was in. They said, that's good luck to them tonight. I'm Bob Wilson, on the scene of Bridgeport, News 8. No, I I oh, I just this. Witnesses say it sounded like an incredible explosion when the fire escape of the Philadelphia apartment building suddenly collapsed and injured three people. NBC 10 cameras were there as a friend holds on to one of the victim's hands, who is apparently conscious as the victim is placed into an ambulance by medics. KYWTV reports a man was quickly injured and two women were rushed to local hospitals. Police believe the bolts of the fire escape appear to have been rusted and dislodged from the brick wall of the apartment building. The victims fell more than 30 feet to the ground, and now the incident is under investigation. Worth noting that the complex is more than 100 years old, and even on Philadelphia's historic registry. Local reporters are all pointing out the city's licenses and inspections department hasn't filed any violations in the past when it comes to the old building. So Sunday's class came without warning. Neighbors say the three victims, reportedly all in their 20s, may have been partying on the fire escape landing before the incident. That's what they, they were partying on the fire escape. And they were all 500 pound people. They overloaded the fire escape. That must, have been, must, must be right. So again, I'm an expert witness on that case. And they settled. But guess who went to court? Everybody. And the city was in court. The owners were in court. I just happened to be in the area inspecting because I inspect the whole, uh, the whole Northeast. And, and I wasn't an asked to be an expert witness at that time, but I happened to be in the area and I went to the site. And this is what I noticed. Fire escape engineers inspect the summary video. We're here in Philadelphia. All right. Some of the preliminary information that I'm getting out of this is that this piece here, which this is the back, used to be up against the building. These two brackets here used to be going to that fourth, fifth floor up there, where you now see the two blowouts. The blowout on the left and the blowout on the right. And it used to be attached there. And then this staircase, which is here, it went feet to they fell. that platform up there. <laughs> and that platform up there also had a bracket, which is now laying inside the floor below. So they either were going up to that upper floor or they were on this fire escape and as soon as it let go on this side or up above which looks like it's all blown out as soon as it let go there so the point that I want to make there guys did the fact that they were partying up there have anything to do with it, with it do with it they can party all they want as a matter of fact while they were partying the firemen arrived is there any problem still if there was a properly maintained fire escape 
So, and there's a physical issue, meaning unless every occupant on there is 500 pounds and 10 feet tall, it's physically impossible to get that many people in there to equal that 200, you know, that 2,500 pound weight limit. And even then you're at the weight limit, meaning it will have to be low tested with even more pounds, as you know, for you to really rip the wall out of, the, you know, rip the, the fire escape out of the wall. But three people, one dead, two were crippled, two women were left maimed for life. And a lot of times, this doesn't even go to court. This is another one that didn't go to court. They sat a lot of court. There's another one, uh, Blackstone. Anybody here from Blackstone? You guys you remember this building? This is a, a, a father and son who basically um, took, I think, uh, five units, turned it into condos. Um, and they basically, uh, to get the new roof on, they, put, they took the fire escapes off or just lifted them, slid all the stuff in there. And what do you do if you're a mechanic you got extra bolts at the end of the engine rebuild? What do you do with those? Put them in the can in case you need it for the next rebuild that you're going to be doing? Well, this fire escape fell. They were selling condos, and they had people on that floor that were, you know, the, the two real estates, a buyer, a seller, and one of the condo board members. And she slid off the building and fell just 10 feet. The other two fire escapes were ready to slide off the building and fall. And it was just a, it was a rotten mess. But all of a sudden, right after this fell, and then nobody got killed. What do you do with your phone? Everybody can reach their phone, what do you do? Who do you call? Who? Call your lawyer first and have your lawyer call who? 911, because you're trapped under all this steel, so this thing went all into litigation. Guys, see? So even a, a properly, uh, improperly repaired fire escape can be very dangerous. Stop. Again, 2014, all these things started happening. Day after a man falls to his death. I was just walking up the street to get to the bus stop, and the cops were right there told me I could come this way. Police say the victim and several others were working on the roof of this privately owned building when the man fell. He may have fallen um, a distance of anywhere from 15 to 20 feet is what's being investigated right now. Tragically, the man died on scene. It's believed he fell from the fire escape and not the roof or a window, although how it happened is still unknown. That's what's being investigated right now to determine the actual cause of the accident itself. Right now, police say the death is not criminal and is being called an industrial accident. There were several witnesses, individuals who were working with the, uh, the deceased party, um, and so we've interviewed them as witnesses in this investigation. It's really sad. I feel bad for his family. I mean, I don't know him, but prayers and best wishes to his family, for sure. Others in the area expressing similar concerns and well wishes, visibly distraught by the day's events. I, mean, I can't even imagine it just coming out to do your job over day, just fall off a building. Like, it's really sad. So again, they didn't fall off the building. I had OSHA call me from out there to, to, to do, they do an investigation. What happened was this is a cantilever unit. And so they were working on the roof. And the cantilever wouldn't go down. And it's the cantilever that is no longer built today, the one that has the weight on the nose and the cable that goes up and over. So his guy went out there because they wanted to use that to bring materials up to the roof. So one guy went out there and jumped all around and she wouldn't go down. So the other two guys came behind. This is the information that I got on the back end. And as they got, they went all the way to the tip and the thing was still frozen. They started jumping around and all of a sudden, how do you die with, in a 10 to 15 foot fall? Well, because when the cable snapped and it hit the front guy right around here but above here and that's why you don't. So the whiplash, okay? So these things are, this one's in here in Boston up on the hill. Um, this is two buildings, you know, in Beacon Hill you have beautiful homes, billion dollar homes that are all like this. So this guy's five story and this guy's five story. This five story can basically see the other guy's roof. So the top guy used to go over and party on the other guy's roof because he had a beautiful roof deck, right? So one night after some good drink, 25 to 30 year old people, him and his girlfriend went, just got home, uh, and they went out for a nightcap in the moonlight, you know, two or three in the morning, and all of a sudden, he, he knew how to get out of his apartment, because um, he had to practice, you know, and go to the deck. She didn't know. The phone rings, as he's going back to answer the call, she goes, no, I'll get it, and she goes, see where the missing rail is up there on the, on the left part? 
she doesn't hit the fire escape. She hits just to the outside. If she falls, five stories to her head down there. So missing components of a fire escape will get you the problem. There's another case. This is the morbid side. It gets, it gets better after, right after this guy. This is in Iowa. Three kids were watching a fireworks display. And they just finished repairing that. And they took the through bolts out of this fire escape. And basically, when they put it back, they forgot to put the through bolts back. They put in lag bolts. So they took half-inch lag bolts through half-inch holes. And guess what happens? Three kids who send the kids to, I mean, parents who send the kids to school, fell there, hit there, and hit in the ground. And in Iowa, you know what they do whenever there's a, a scene where nobody got killed, but people got maimed and injured, where do they put the evidence? Well, in Iowa, you try to find the closest field. It was out about eight blocks away. They threw this fire escape in a field. <laughs> and this is where we went back and we found the fire escape. And we found the smoking gun. And that is the bolt was still in the bracket. This is all surrounded by lawyers and building officials. And, you know, it was kind of funny that we're digging through this field eight, eight blocks away and we found the bolt. That's the fire escape that maimed three people. So with that, they put it back, and they were so scared when they put it back, they put through bolts back in. Then they put a leg on it to the ground. So you need both of you should need one. And on that tube that they put on there, they put it right to the roof, on a pressure-treated sleeper or right onto the asphalt shingles. <laughs> and on the two legs that weren't here before, that's why she was torquing, should that go on pressure-treated sleepers or should that go into the asphalt singles. And she at least put a screw down there. I was able to go back during my reinspection because right in this corner, there was a hole there for some lag bolts to hold it in the corner. I was able to pick it up after this inspection and walk it over two feet and then bring it back and drive it right back in place. So they settled very quickly. Yes, question? Just a comment. Were they um, charged the people with tampering with evidence? Um, it wasn't the people. It was the, 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 uh, the owners. Uh, it was a guy that owned like 40 or 50 con uh, you know, houses in that area because it's a major university. And so his repair crew were fixing the window and the shingles. So when they removed the fire escape, fixed the shingles, and then put it back, they didn't put it back correctly. But when it was found in the field, he said he walks away. Um, was that after the collapse? Yeah, they just took the, the piece and they brought it to a field and threw it in the field. And, Weeks later or months later, when I got hired to go and take a look at it, we're like, where's the fire escape? They're like, oh, we got it in a, we got it in a special place over there. I'm like, 